Hello and welcome. This video is the first in a series about how the Roman Empire, and therefore the Byzantine Empire, got its emperor. As much as Eastern Roman history generally stretches from the time of Constantine the Great to the fall of Constantinople in 1453, it is important to remember that there was no break between the entity of the Roman Empire and that of the Eastern Roman Empire. Byzantine history was Roman history. Perhaps one of the most striking institutions of the Eastern Roman Empire was its emperors. Emperors such as Theodosius the Great, Romanus Lecapenos, and even Constantine the Eleventh were all in a long line of successive emperors going back to Augustus, a time before even the advent of Christ. And yet, how did the Roman Republic a people who to even call someone a king was an insult, develop and eventually embrace the monarchy that would be such a feature of its later society. This series of videos shall look at what Theodore Mommsen called, and is known as, the constitutional settlements that established Augustus not as a dictator or a king, but an emperor. The legacy of Augustus cannot be understated. Emperors wanted to emulate him. Michael Sellus tells us that Romanus III wanted to model his reign on Augustus, amongst others. Though this channel will not delve into the era before Constantine and Diocletian often, it would be a shame not to cover the story of how Rome got its first emperor. Now, without further ado, let us begin with Octavian's rise to power. Gaius Octavius was born on the 23rd of September, 63 BC, in the year of Cicero's and Gaius Antonius's consulship. He was the son of Gaius Octavius, who died when the young Octavius was four years old. Octavius was nicknamed Thurinus, meaning the Thurian, and grew up in Villatre. In 52 BC, he gave the funeral oration for his grandmother, Julia, who was the sister of Julius Caesar, Octavius's great-uncle. It was here that he first caught the eye of his illustrious relative. Four years on, Octavius was awarded military honours when Caesar celebrated a triumph for his war in Africa against the anti-Caesarians there. Octavius followed Caesar to Spain, and took part in his war against the son of Pompey and Titus Labanius. He was accompanied by his retinue, probably consisting of Mycenaeus and Marcus Agrippa, among others. On this campaign, Caesar grew to admire Octavius, who was mutually affectionate. Caesar sent Octavius to Apollonia in Macedonia, modern-day Albania, to study and prepare troops for Caesar's upcoming foreign wars. Then, on the 15th of March, 43 BC, one of the most important events in European, certainly Roman history, occurred. The assassination of Julius Caesar, who had recently become perpetual dictator of Rome. Caesar was assassinated by members of the Senate, worried that he was trying to become a king. In Caesar's will, he made Octavius his heir, if he accepted his name, Gaius Julius Caesar. Its importance was even noted at the time, though its legacy was not yet apparent, for coins were minted celebrating liberty, and Cicero, the ever-active documenter of his times, wrote about the Ides of March. Suetonius reports that Octavius considered what to do now his great-uncle was dead. Suetonius the Life of the Divine Augustus, Section 8, Paragraph 2. News then came that Caesar had been assassinated after naming him his heir, and Augustus was tempted, for a while, to put himself under the protection of the troops nearby. However, deciding that this would be rash and injudicious, he returned to Rome, and there enter upon his inheritance. And... In Augustus's own words, Augustus 
the Rares Gestai 1.1, at the age of 19, on my own initiative and at my own expense, I raised an army by means of which I restored liberty to the Republic, which had been oppressed by the tyranny of a faction. Thus accepting the name of his adopted father, Gaius Octavius became Gaius Julius Caesar Octavian. He was able to muster a large army of soldiers loyal to Caesar and join Cicero and the consuls Hirtius and Panza against Mark Antony, who had dominated Roman affairs in the aftermath of Caesar's death. Cicero, taking Octavian under his wing, hoped to use Octavian to defeat Mark Antony, who had been named a public enemy and hopefully restore the Republic. To this end, he wrote and gave his Philippics, just as Demosthenes the Athenian had. While Demosthenes used his Philippics to turn Athenian opinion against Philip II of Macedon, Cicero did the same to Mark Antony, totally slandering and lambasting his character. During this time, Octavian was elected to the Senate to the rank of pro praetor. Augustus raised Gestae 1.2 to 4. On that account, the Senate passed decrees in my honour, enrolling me in its order in the consulship of Aulus Hirtius and Gaius Pansa, and assigning me the right to give my opinion among the consulars. And it gave me imperium power. It ordered me as pro praetor to see to it together with the consuls, that the Republic should come to no harm. This alliance of Cicero, the consuls and Octavian, put Cicero in the strongest position in Rome for the rest of 44 to 43 BC, until the Battle of Mutina. Despite inflicting a defeat on Mark Antony, it resulted in the deaths of Hirtius and Pansa. Octavian, who had gone with the dead consuls to defeat Antony, marched on Rome, and the people elected him suffect consul. This meant he took up the rest of the consular term from the deceased Hirtius and Panser. This broke the law of the Lex Annalis, which barred people from taking office before a certain age. Octavian was 20 when he became consul. The minimum age to be voted consul was 42. However, he did have popular support, and, to quote Cicero, Cicero Pro Milone 4.11 Silent enim legis inter arna, the laws fall silent in times of war. At this point, Cicero's position as champion of the Republic took a turn for the worse, as his relationship with Octavian started to become distant. Octavian's natural ally was Mark Antony, not Cicero, who is famously believed to have said about Octavian. The young man should be praised, honoured, and disposed of. The shaky alliance between Cicero and Octavian continued until November 43 BC, when, after meeting with Lepidus and Mark Antony, Octavian formed an alliance with them, and the people voted them the novel office of Triumvir for five years with the aim of organising the Republic. The term of this triumvirate would start from the 1st of January, 42 BC, and end on the 31st of December, 38 BC. Augustus Reis Gestae 1.4 In the same year, when both consuls had fallen in battle, the people appointed me consul and triumvir for organising the Republic. Though the triumvirs were new, it was not without precedent. In the 80s BC, Sulla became dictator for a year to restore the Republic. Thus, it was a little like a dictatorship of free people. However, they did acts that were contrary to the Republican system, such as in 39 BC, when they appointed Suffolk consuls for the next eight years, and in 38 BC, when they appointed 59 Suffolk praetors when there were supposed to only be eight. As well as all this, there were, of course, the prescriptions. 
This was a list drawn up that made all those named public enemies. It made it legal for a citizen to be killed and the state to confiscate their property. These had a haunting memory when Sulla did it and must have been equally horrifying when the second triumvirate did it in 43 BC. The most famous man to fall victim to the prescriptions was Marcus Tullius Cicero, who was killed by December 43. Equally, Virgil, the well-known poet and author of the Aeneid, was prescribed, but was only saved by the intervention of Octavian's retinue. Suetonius, the life of Virgil, 19 to 20. Presently, he began to write of Roman history, but thinking himself unequal to the subject, turned to the bucolics, especially in order to sing the praises of Asinius Pollio, Alfrenius Varus, and Cornelius Gallus, because at the time of the assignment of the lands beyond the Po, which were divided among the veterans by order of the triumvirs after the victory at Philippi, these men had saved him from ruin. Then he wrote the Georgics in honour of Mycenaeus, because he had rendered him aid, when the poet was still but little known, against the violence of one of the veterans, from whom Virgil narrowly escaped death in a quarrel about his farm. Thus, with the establishment of the officially recognised Second Triumvirate, the young Octavius had, by the age of twenty, been catapulted to being one of the three leading men of Rome. In the next part, I shall talk about the last series of civil wars which would see the defeat of the last Republicans and the collapse of the Triumvirate, ending with the decisive battle of Actium. In 42 BC, Caesar was deified. That same year was the Battle of Philippi, which saw the elimination of Caesar's murderers. Suetonius, Life of Augustus, 13.1 Having formed an alliance with Antony and Lepidus, Augustus defeated Brutus and Cassius at Philippi, though in ill health at the time. In the first of the two battles fought, he was driven out of his camp and escaped with some difficulty to Antony's command. After the second and decisive one, he showed no clemency to his beaten enemies, but sent Brutus's head to Rome for throwing it at the feet of Caesar's statue and insulted the more distinguished of his prisoners. Octavian executed the remaining leaders of the Republicans. With the Republicans dead, the triumvirs split the provinces between them. Antony took command of the east, Octavian went to Italy, and Lepidus was given Africa. In 41 BC, Lucius Antonius, the brother of Marcus Antonius, rebelled against Octavian in Perusia. Octavian massacred the people of Perusia. Octavian used the land he confiscated from the Perusians to settle his veterans. We get an idea of the effect the barbarity of Octavian had on normal people from the words of Propertius. Propertius, Elegies, 1.21-22 Gallus ripped from the midst of Caesar's swords, tried to escape the enemy units, but was not able. This was especially painful for me, my Etruscan soil. You allowed my neighbour's limbs to go abandoned. No earth covers his poor bones. Neighbouring Umbria, below Perusia, on the plain bore me. Fertile Umbria, productive land. Octavian and Antony fell out and fought each other in Italy again. The next year, Octavian allied Mark Antony by marrying his sister Octavia to him in what is known as the Brundisium Pact. Antony and Octavia celebrated an Orvatio, a kind of mini triumph where you ride into Rome on horseback. From 40 to 36 BC, Octavian fought Sextus Pompey, the last of Pompey's sons, known as the Arch Pirate. He controlled Sicily and even freed slaves to fight for him. This was one of Octavian's most difficult foes, and victory was achieved 
thanks to the brilliance of his commander Agrippa. Augustus Res Gestae 25.1 I made the sea peaceful and freed it of pirates. In that war I captured about 30,000 slaves who had escaped from their masters and taken up arms against the Republic, and I handed them over to their masters for punishment. Meanwhile, from 40 to 34 BC, Mark Antony was away in the east fighting Parthia. In 37 BC, the Imperium of the Triumvirs was renewed for five more years by a popular vote. Res Gestae 7.1 I was triumvir for organising the Republic for ten consecutive years. This second term, either starting retrospectively from the 1st of January 37 BC or from the 1st of January 36 BC. In 36 BC, Lepidus came over from Africa and tried to make himself the leading figure in the triumvirate. Octavian outmanoeuvred him and managed to take his twenty legions off of him. Lepidus's life was spared, but was forced into exile at Cydisae for the rest of his life, even letting him keep the lifelong office of Pontifex Maximus. However, it did mean Lepidus did not come to the sticky end that Mark Antony would suffer. Appian also reports that in this year, having dealt with a surge of burglars in Rome, Octavian would restore the Republic when Antony returned. Appian, The Civil Wars, Book 5, Paragraph 132. He burned the writings which contained evidence concerning the civil strife, and said that he would restore the constitution entirely when Antony should return from the Parthian War, for he was persuaded that Antony too would be willing to lay down the government, the civil wars being at an end. From 35 to 33 BC, Octavian fought his own foreign war in Illyria and built new buildings in Rome. Mark Antony in 34 BC promised that he would restore power to the Senate and people upon his return, and then again in 32 BC. Suetonius tells us that Antony said that it was Octavian himself that prevented the Republic from being restored. This gives an idea of Antony's propaganda against Octavian. This threatened Octavian, who to the Romans was clearly acting too much like a monarch, which Antony could use against him. Cassius Dio, Book 50, Chapter 7.1 Such then was the strength of the two sides. For his part, Antony vowed to his troops that he would carry on the war with no thought of truce and he further promised that within two months after his victory he would lay down his command and restore to the Senate and the people the whole of their authority. In 33 BC, Octavian became Suffolk Consul for the second time. The triumvirate was not renewed, though both were acting as if they were triumvir. Also, the two triumvirs started a propaganda war against each other, Mycenaeus, as part of Octavian's propaganda, must have approached poets such as Virgil, Horace, and Propertius, and less well-known ones such as Varius Rufus, who created the Thyestes for Octavian's triumph, Plotius Tuca, who helped publish the Aeneid, Valgius Rufus, and Domitius Marsus, both accomplished authors, to help solidify Octavian's position. In 32 BC, it was clear that war between Octavian and Mark Antony would come. Octavian got the soldiers and people of the western provinces to swear an oath of loyalty to him. He may have done this to gain some kind of legitimacy because Octavian's position was quite weak. This way Octavian gained emergency support from the people themselves. Clearly he was worried about their loyalty and that Antony's propaganda was effective. Compounding this, some 300 senators, nearly half of the Senate, at great risk to themselves, fled to Mark Antony. Perhaps this portrays the fact that senators trusted Antony far more than Octavian in honouring his pledge to restore the Republic. Octavian got Antony declared a public enemy, hostis publicus, after Octavian 
read Mark Antony's will in the Senate, war was declared on Ptolemaic Egypt, and thus an indirect war on Antony. Augustus raised Gestae 25.2. The whole of Italy of its own free will swore to obey me, and demanded as leader in the war in which I was victorious at Actium, the Gallic and Spanish provinces, Africa, Sicily and Sardinia, also swore to obey me. Galerius Massala and Octavian, for a third time, were elected consuls for 31 BC. This was a flashpoint year, for at the Battle of Actium, the last of the civil wars was finally decided. Virgil vividly describes the battle in the Aeneid. Virgil, Aeneid, Book 8, lines 677 to 703. For the shield's central glory could be seen great fleets of brazen galleys, and the fight at Actium, where, ablaze with war's array, Lucati's peak glowed o'er the golden tide. Caesar Augustus led Italia's sons to battle. At his side, cordant move, senate and Roman people, with their gods of hearth and home, and all Olympian powers, Uplifted on his ship he stands, his brows beneath a double glory smile, and bright over his forehead beams the Julian star. In neighbouring region, great Agrippa leads, by favour of fair winds and friendly heaven, his squadron forth. Upon his brows he wears the peerless emblem of his rostral crown, posing in barbaric splendour shine the armies of Antony. In victor's garb from nations in the land of morn he rides, and from the Red Sea, bringing in his train Egypt and Syria, utmost Bactria's horde, and last, O oh shameless, his Egyptian spouse. All to the fight make haste, the slanted oars, and the triple beaks of brass up tear the waves to angry foam as to the deep they speed. Like hills on hilltops hurled, or Cyclades drifting and clashing in the sea, so vast that shock of castled ships and mighty men. Swift, arrowy steel, and balls of blazing tow rain o'er the waters till the sea's god's world flows red with slaughter. Valeus Paterculus describes the battle as being decisive, and it was. In 30 BC, Octavian again was consul. He invaded Cleopatra's domain and took Alexandria on the 1st of August. Mark Antony and Queen Cleopatra VII, now totally defeated, committed suicide. There was also some poetic justice to be found in Octavian's conquest of Egypt, as Plutarch reports. Plutarch, Life of Cicero, chapter 49, paragraph 6. Moreover, as soon as he, Octavian, had finally defeated Antony, and when he himself was consul, he chose Cicero's son as his colleague in the office, and it was in his consulship that the Senate took down the statues of Antony, made void the other honours that had been paid him, and decreed besides that no Antony should have the name of Marcus. Thus the heavenly powers devolved upon the family of Cicero the final steps in the punishment of Antony. The crisis of civil war was now over, yet so too was the need for an authoritarian figure like Octavian. The consulship gave Octavian his legitimate power after his term as triumvir had ended. In the summer, Octavian returned to Rome. He assumed the permanent title Imperator. The Senate voted Octavian a triple triumph, one for defeating Cleopatra, one for his Illyrian wars, and one for defeating Sextus Pompey. Triumphal arches in Brundisium and Rome were set up, Octavian's birthday and the date of Actium became a public holiday. Later Caligula 
would end the 1st of August as a public holiday because it celebrated Romans fighting each other. A festival every five years in honour of Octavian was also voted by the Senate. Prayers and effigies were made to Octavian. He was given the honour of being able to sit at the front, which is where the elite sat. He was granted a siege crown. He was granted tribunician auxilium in perpetuity, the Athenian vote in court, and the right to judge appeals. The Lexania, a public vote, gave him the right to create patricians. The Senate ratified all of Octavian's acts, thus legitimising all of his actions as triumvir, and voted him additional honours including closing the Temple of Janus. This signified that peace had been restored. Despite the end of the civil wars, with the death of Antony, the Republic was not restored. There was one man that prevented the constitution of the Republic from restoration, Caesar Octavian. By 28 BC, he had held the consulship six times. He had prescribed people and killed many Roman citizens and members of the elite. He had been elected consul in absentia at least three times, which was illegal. He had been consul almost every year since 31 BC, which was also illegal, as one had to wait ten years before holding the same office again. He had not climbed up the cursus honorum, that is going through the republican offices, from quaestor to aedile to praetor to consul. In addition, he had all 24 lictors, the men that hold the fasces and signify the imperium, power, of a magistrate. Effectively, the lictors were a kind of bodyguard for an official and fulfilled some civil duties. A consul was supposed to have 12 lictors. By having 24, not only was Octavian raising his status above all other magistrates, but most likely deprived the other consul of the 12 he was supposed to have. Indeed, Octavian had been co-founder of the Triumvirate that had interfered with the normal running of the Republic. If you were a Roman aristocrat in 29 BC, would you think that the Republic had been restored? Probably not. However, what was Octavian going to do now? The crisis was over. Peace had officially been established. He had triumphed over all enemies. His acts had been made legal. He had been highly honoured. The Senate, as much as they had been celebrating the conqueror of Egypt, were more likely giving Octavian no excuse to continue to act with emergency powers or find cause to renew them. All of this was voted by the senators that had stayed in Rome, and so were his backers, or at least indifferent to Octavian, which must tell you something about the attitude of the aristocracy to what had become a tyrant. This is very understandable, based on his acts and building programs, such as the construction of the Tomb of the Juli, Octavian looked far more like a monarch with Rome under his dominion than a man who was about to restore the Roman Republic. Octavian at this point had two options. Either he had to step down and restore the Republic, or find a way to legitimise and institutionalise his power. In 28 BC, Octavian was elected consul for the sixth time. However, unlike his previous consulships from 31 to 29 BC, Octavian gave Agrippa half of the fasces and gave an oath to the Senate that his consulship would be according to the laws of the Republic. This was the beginning of the first constitutional settlement that saw enormous changes to the position and powers of Octavian in the Roman Republic. Augustus Reis Gestae 34-35 In my sixth and seventh consulships, after I had extinguished civil wars and through universal agreement, had power over everything, I handed over to the state from my power to the decision of the Roman Senate and people. For this service of mine I was named Augustus by decree of the Senate, and the doorposts of my house were publicly adorned with bay leaves 
and a civic crown was fixed over my door and a golden shield was placed in the Curia Julia, which the Senate and the people of Rome gave me as is attested by the inscription on this shield. On account of my courage, clemency, justice and piety. After this time I excelled all in influence, although I had no greater power than the others who were my colleagues in each magistracy. Question is, why this sudden change? Clearly, after coming to some sort of decision, or maybe even agreement, the fact that he says in his res gestae that he gave up power through universal agreement indicates that it was with the approval of both the Senate and the people that he did this. He also acknowledged that before this settlement he had been all-powerful, but had given it up as was in keeping with Republican tradition. He explains away the power that he had after this being in line with normal Republican magistracies, and that any additional power was down to his influence rather than some sort of official autocratic authority. This message he wanted to get across to the man in the street as well as the senators. In essence, Octavian gave up the pretense of having the power of the triumvirs, which had expired in 33 BC, and now held power in a legitimate position. The consulship and that the normal functions of the senate had resumed, such as the other consul having half of the lictors. Valeus Paterculus, a near contemporary of Augustus's, gave his opinion, a senatorial aristocrat's view, of the settlement to him. Valeus Paterculus, Short Roman History, Book 2, Chapter 89. The civil wars were ended after twenty years, foreign war suppressed, peace restored, the frenzy of arms everywhere lulled to rest, validity was restored to the laws, authority to the courts, and dignity to the senate. The power of the magistrates was reduced to its former limits, with the sole exception that two were added to the eight existing praetors. The old traditional form of the republic was restored. Agriculture returned to the fields, respect to religion, to mankind freedom from anxiety, and to each citizen his property rights were now assured. Old laws were usefully amended, and new laws passed for the general good. The revision of the Senate, while not drastic, was not lacking in severity. The chief men of the state who had won triumphs and had held high office were at the invitation of Augustus induced to adorn the city. In the case of the consulship only, Caesar was not able to have his way, but was obliged to hold that office consecutively until the eleventh time in spite of his frequent efforts to prevent it. But the dictatorship which the people persistently offered him, he as stubbornly refused. Again we can pick out why this would have consolidated Octavian's position in legitimising his power. The power of magistrates were restored to their previous level, except for the two extra praetors. Considering that the triumvirate had had upwards of 50 praetors, sundry Suffolk consuls and so on, here Octavian had clearly restored the normal running of the Republic. Hence, Paterculus saying the old traditional form of the Republic was restored. Also, there were no more prescriptions. If a man like Paterculus could have freedom from anxiety and property rights, then it is an assertion that people's property was not going to be confiscated by the triumvirs anymore. A similar tone of relief was shared by the Laudatio Torii in regards to the end of prescriptions. Inscriptorum Latinorum Scriptorum, 8393, section 2, line 25. When peace had been restored throughout the world and the Republic restored, we began to enjoy quiet and happy times. With the restoration of the Republic, the acts of the tyrannical triumvirate had to be undone. On the 1st of January 27 BC, all triumviral edicts were annulled. Tacitus, Annals, Book 3, Chapter 28. The Caesar Augustus 
in his sixth consulship, his power assured, cancelled his edicts as triumvir and laid down the terms for Rus to have peace and principate. Coins were minted with the legend, laws and rights of the Roman people restored. In addition to these many honours and the restoration of the officers of the Republic, Octavian was given a new name. The Senate originally wanted him to take the name Romulus, which he himself quite liked, as a second founder of the city. This had its problems since Romulus was a king, exactly what Augustus was trying not to look like. Also, in one version of Romulus's death, he was torn apart by the Senate. One can imagine some old senator reminding Augustus, If you act like Romulus, you will suffer the fate of Romulus. Instead, Mantius Plancus suggested that he should be called Augustus, because it was new and sacred, and consecrated places which had had augural rites performed were called August. This was much better, as it had no connection to tyranny. This also explains why Augustus refused the dictatorship. It would likely bring up unsavoury memories of Julius Caesar. Most importantly, the Senate asked him to hold imperium over the provinces. Augustus refused and said he would only have the provinces that were turbulent or near the frontiers. He was thus voted imperium over these lands for ten years. He had control of Gaul, Spain, Syria, Egypt, Cyprus and Cilicia. He later received Lyricum from the control of the Senate. He added to the empire Dalmatia, Galatia, Judea, Pannonia, Moesia, Raetia and Noricum. The public provinces were Sicily, Sardinia and Corsica, Africa, Cyrene and Crete, Asia, Bithynia and Pontus, Macedonia and Archaea. Illyricum, until Augustus was given control, as well as Illyricum, until Augustus was given control of it. Augustus, once he had finished with them, returned Cyprus, southern Spain and southern Gaul to the control of the Senate. This asserted Augustus's military dominance as he now had control of the provinces with the most soldiers. So the main points of this settlement were the repeal of triumviral laws and powers, imperium of a large province for 10 years for Augustus, Octavian changed his name to Augustus, new buildings including the tomb of the Julii and Augustus's house on the Palatine Hill with a temple to Apollo inside were built in 28 and 27 BC respectively. Games were held and he cancelled debts to the treasury prior to Actium. He was chosen Princeps Senatus, that is, he could speak first in the Senate. He was consul, he held a census, he was voted honours, he doubled the pay of his bodyguards and paid out money to senators and paid for free grain for the people. Had Augustus resigned his power as he claimed? The answer to this is no. He was the leading man in the state and effectively all-powerful. However, his powers now came from good republican officers and traditions rather than the extraordinary and tyrannical. With the civil wars over and the Republic restored, one might have expected that everything returned to normal. The fears of a damnatio under Augustus were gone. Or was it? This was the beginning of a political struggle between the restoration of the Republic and the restoration of the domination of Augustus, but under a much subtler form than in 31 to 29 BC. After the first constitutional settlement, you see a kind of monopolization of the military by Augustus. This was vital as Rome was a militaristic society. Part of the restoration of the Republic meant that the senatorial aristocracy had the chance to compete for military honours and glory, such as triumphs, ovations, and being heralded imperator. Another reward for winning a triumph was that the triumphator could construct a building in Rome. For example, Gaius Sossius constructed a temple to Apollo in the Campus Martius from 34 to 31 BC. In 29 BC, Octavian had adopted the title of Imperator. 
He had been acclaimed by his troops as Imperator 21 times. He received two ovations and the triple triumph in 29 BC. The Senate wanted to vote him more, but he declined them all. In 27 BC, after the first constitutional settlement, Augustus had control of the large province, including many of the areas likely to have large military actions and where most of the 28 legions were deployed. The areas under the authority of Augustus were governed by delegates appointed directly by him, known as legati. Only two public provinces actually had legions, Africa and Macedonia. These proconsuls were chosen from the Senate and were entirely independent of Augustus. He had no power in these provinces. Thus the ability to gain military honours outside of the sphere of Augustus was very limited, but not impossible. In 28 BC there were three triumphs, one for Gaius Calvisius Sabinus's victory in Spain, and one for Gaius Caranius's victory in Gaul, the last for the proconsul of Africa, Licinius Utronius Paetus. In 27 BC there were two triumphs, one for Marcus Licinius Crassus, the proconsul of Macedonia, who had won victory over the Getae, the other for Valerius Messala Corvinus and his victory in Gaul. In 26 BC there was a single triumph in Spain for Sextus Apuleius, and then there were no more triumphs. In total, there were four triumphs for Augustus's legati and two for the senatorial proconsuls. Augustus, rather than have the triumphs himself, let his legati have them instead. Finally, in 25 BC, he put a stop to triumphs altogether and prevented his generals from being awarded triumphs in the future. Marcus Vinicius won a victory against the Germans and had to share his being heralded Imperator with Augustus, who was also acclaimed Imperator. This is why Augustus was able to be acclaimed Imperator 21 times, because he took the acclamations of his subordinates. Military honour had been monopolised by Augustus over his legati. Augustus was awarded the right to wear the triumphal wreath and robe on the first day of each year. Thus, this made him a kind of perpetual triumphator, and prevented others from having a triumph. The Temple of Janus in 25 BC was closed once again, signifying peace, and closing the door on private military glory. Augustus's own military record was both quite spectacular and also not so at the same time. Most of Augustus's wars have been fought against Romans, such as Sextus Pompey, Cassius and Brutus, Mark Antony, and for most of the decisive battles like Actium and Philippi, Augustus had fallen ill just before the battle and spent most of it in his bed. Marcus Agrippa had commanded at Actium, Mark Antony had commanded at Philippi, and it was Cornelius Gallus that had captured Alexandria from the Egyptians. Augustus had fought some Illyrians and conquered Egypt, or at least his lieutenant Gallus had conquered it for him. In 29 BC, Augustus sent Agrippa to finish off extending Roman dominion over all of Spain. In 26 BC, he took command himself and fought a campaign writing a memoir about his Spanish wars, just as Julius Caesar had done. He spent most of the time ill and gave control of the war to his subordinates. The war was finished in 24 BC. It was most likely fought for propaganda reasons to give Augustus a victory and military glory that was not extracted from the blood of his fellow countrymen. Also, economically, the Roman Empire had resources to be gained from the mines of northern Spain. In 27 BC, Crassus defeated the Bastane and killed their king Deldo in battle. He was hailed Imperator and voted a triumph, and Licinius Crassus claimed the Spolia Opima. The Spolia Opima were given to a Roman commander that had managed to kill an enemy ruler in single combat in battle. You were then allowed to dedicate their armour to Jupiter. This had only been sought thrice prior to Licinius Crassus, 
so this was a very rare and ancient military honour. Augustus told Crassus that he could not have the spolia opima because he was not fighting under his own auspices, and that to claim the spolia opima had to be the supreme commander, in this case, the consul. Livy, Roman History, Book 4, Chapter 20, 5 to 7 and 11. I have followed all previous chroniclers in relating that Aulus Cornelius Cossus was Tribunus Militum when he deposited the second spolia opima in the temple of Jupiter Feretrius. However, in addition to the fact that they can only properly be spolia opima when they are stripped by one commander from another, and we recognise as commander only the man under whose auspices the war is fought, the actual inscription on the spolia proves against these chroniclers and me that Cossus was consul when he took them. I was informed that Augustus Caesar, founder and restorer of all of our temples, entered the shrine of Jupiter Fretrius, which he had had built after many years of neglect and dilapidation, and himself read the inscription on the linen corslet, and I have therefore felt that it would be almost sacrilege to deprive Cossus of so great a witness to his spoils as Caesar. Everyone is at liberty to form his own conjecture. These doubtful points, in my belief, can be made to support any opinion. The fact remains that the man who fought the battle placed the newly won spolia in the sacred shrine near Jupiter himself, to whom they were consecrated, and, with Romulus in full view, two witnesses to be dreaded by any forger, and that he described himself in the inscription as A. Cornelius Cossus, Consul. So Livy confirms that Augustus was right that Crassus would have needed to be consul to dedicate the spolia opima. Or does he? Livy says that Cossus was Tribunus Militum, which is what all of his sources say. However, Livy says the dedicator of the spolia opima also had to be supreme commander, thus Cossus had to be a consul which goes against what Livy's sources say and what Livy himself thought to be true. Augustus went to the temple that he himself restored and armed with the linen corslet about the spolia from over 400 years ago, told Livy that Cossus was consul and that the spolia could not be dedicated if the Roman commander was a subordinate. So what options does this give us? Either Cossus never gave the spolia because he was not consul, the historians Livy was using and his own common knowledge were wrong, or, unthinkable as it may seem, the consul for the eighth time, Augustus, had forged the corselet. Livy inserts a subtle curse at Augustus and wishes him the ire of Jupiter and Romulus for forging the spolia corselet. This affair with the spolia opima, Augustus's control of most of the military, and monopolization of military glory, show that a very important aspect of the Republic had not been restored, or certainly had only been restored to a certain amount, for the rest was in the control of Augustus himself. Two episodes during the period 27 to 24 BC reveal the power that Augustus was able to wield as consul and show how he continued his domination over the Roman Republic. In 26 BC, there was the affair with Cornelius Gallus. Augustus was now consul for the eighth time. Gallus was governor of Egypt, a close ally of Augustus, and had captured Alexandria and was one of the greatest lyric poets of his time. However, Cornelius Gallus and Augustus fell out. Cassius Dio, Roman History, Book 53, Chapter 23 to 24. By contrast, Cornelius Gallus behaved with great arrogance in consequence of the honour he had received. 
He circulated much disparaging gossip concerning Augustus and committed many other indefensible actions besides. Not only did he set up statues of himself throughout Egypt, but even inscribed a list of his deeds on the pyramids. He accused over these acts by Valerius Largus, his friend and companion, and was degraded by Augustus, so he was banned from staying in his province. After this, many attacked him and brought numerous indictments against him. The Senate unanimously voted that he should be convicted in the courts, exiled and deprived of his estate, that his estate should be given to Augustus, and that the Senate itself offer sacrifices. Gallus's spirit was broken by this treatment, and he took his own life before the decrees came into effect. And in Suetonius, Suetonius' Life of the Divine Augustus, chapter 66, Augustus banned Gallus on account of his ungrateful and ill-disposed nature from his house and his provinces. When, however, Gallus too was driven to death by accusations of informers and decrees of the Senate, Augustus, while praising the loyalty of those who showed how very strongly they felt on his behalf, nevertheless burst into tears and lamented his position in that he alone was not allowed to fix the limits he, he wished to any anger with his friends. Gallus committed suicide to avoid the state from confiscating his lands and property from the trial. His lands and property would be able to pass on to his heirs this way. Proculeius, Gallus's friend, thought that what Largus had done was shocking and gained the latter odium. So what happened? Gallus did put up inscriptions, which we have today. Here is one such example. MGL Cooley, The Age of Augustus, Philae inscription, Lactor 17, part 5. Gaius Cornelius Gallus, son of Gnaeus, Eques Romanus, first prefect of Alexandria and Egypt, after the defeat of the kings by Caesar, son of a god, who quelled a revolt of the Thebaid in fifteen days, in which he defeated the enemy twice in battle, he stormed five cities, Berasus, Coptus, Ceramis, Thebes the Great, and Ophis, who captured the leaders of these revolts, who led his army beyond the Nile cataract into an area which neither the Roman people nor the kings of Egypt had invaded militarily, who subdued the Thebaid, which had been a constant source of fear to all the kings, who received ambassadors from the king of Ethiopia at Philae, and granted the king of and granted the king the status of client, who established the principality of the Tria Contationus in Ethiopia, dedicated this as an offering to the ancestral gods, and the Nile his helper. Dry and laudatory, but hardly treason. Gallus and Augustus must have fallen out, while the former was in Egypt and the other in Gaul. To announce that someone was no longer a friend in Roman times, one of the parties would declare that the other was not allowed in their house. Augustus did this and barred Gallus from his house, but also his provinces. By doing this, Augustus turned their private falling out into a state matter. Considering that these provinces were the senates, under Augustus's supervision, was Augustus overstepping his bounds by treating the state's lands as if they were his own? Now it was a public issue. All of the opportunists and enemies of Gallus began to accuse him of myostas to the Senate rather than taking him to court as was what was supposed to happen. With the Senate voting that Gallus was to be found guilty of treason and his property to be given to Augustus, this negated both the function of the courts and was monarchic since in the Republic the state received confiscated property, not a private individual. By giving it to Augustus was the act of a monarchy. Despite his crocodile tears for Gallus's death, it seems unlikely that Augustus was powerless to stop this affair with Gallus getting so out of hand. Considering that he excelled all others in influence, unless of course he didn't know what was going on, and events 
outpaced the slow communication between Rowe and Augustus, who was in Gaul, it seems very likely that Augustus could have put a stop to this. This tragic affair raises questions. How far was Augustus willing to go to maintain his power and monopoly on military glory to the point of sacrificing one of his friends? He had already probably forged a religious inscription to deny Licinius Crassus the spolia opima. Were the accusations against Gallus those of opportunists, or was it a move by the opponents of Augustus to eliminate one of his closest supporters? One thing which is quite clear from this episode was that the Republic had not been restored. In the same year as the Gallus affair, was also a small episode concerning Massala Corvinus, another one of Augustus's retinue. In 26 BC, Tacitus tells us about a short but significant episode that laid bare the power of Augustus and his officials had after the first constitutional settlement. Tacitus, Annals, Book 6, Chapter 10 to 11. As recent prefect of the city, of this power, which was permanent and more oppressive, because there was no tradition of obeying it, for long ago, when kings and then the magistrates sat out from Rome, so that the city would not lack government, a man used to be chosen for that period to administer justice and deal with crises. A relic of this survives in the appointment of a deputy for the consuls during the Latin festival. Then in the civil wars, Augustus put Kilnius Mycenus of the equestrian order in full charge of Rome and Italy. Later, after Augustus gained power, because of the size of the population and the slowness of legal redress, he made appointments from among the consulars to discipline slaves and those citizens who are insolently unruly if there is no force to fear. The first recipient of this power was Massala Corvinus, but he resigned after a few days on the grounds that he did not understand his function. So the prefect of the city was for the maintenance of law and order in Rome and represented the consuls for when they were away, in this case Augustus. After Corvinus resigned, Augustus waited until 16 BC to fill the post again, this time with his friend Statilius Taurus, who fulfilled his role splendidly. Saint Jerome tells us that Massala Corvinus was in the post for six days and resigned because the prefect of the city's power was not for citizens. That is to say, it was against the interest of the citizens and was unrepublican. Seneca the Younger adds that Massala Corvinus was remembered as saying, I am ashamed of my power. This tells us that this role was too monarchic for even one of Augustus' friends to take, and since this was essentially a prefecture of Augustus' own making, it must tell us something about the true power of Augustus in 26 BC. However, considering the post was not filled again until three years after the third constitutional settlement, it must indicate that by 26 BC, the principate was not instituted yet. Another little episode reveals how Augustus was de facto head of state and that the domination of Augustus from before the first settlement was still a reality. The Treaty of Mytilene in 25 BC was a small episode where Junius Silanus, the consul for that year with Augustus, ratified a treaty with Mytilene and confirmed it with the Senate and wrote a letter to Augustus asking his permission to do this also. This all seems fine, except why was a consul, the head of the Republic for that year, asking his co-consul for permission when before, when dealing with a foreign power, the consul only needed to ratify it with the Senate and not seek the permission of his fellow consul. Clearly Augustus was starting to become the head of the state. This would all boil over in 24 BC, which would prove to be a time of crisis for Augustus, and would result in the second constitutional settlement. 
24 BC was a period of political crisis. In the beginning of that year, Augustus's acts were ratified by the Senate. They also voted that he should be freed from the laws and was no longer bound by them. Lastly, Marcellus, Augustus's nephew, was elected Edal, and his son-in-law Tiberius was elected Quaestor for 23 BC. It could be argued that the Senate voted Augustus to be above the law and ratified his acts so that he could step down without the threat of prosecution. Considering that Caesar had started a civil war, because as soon as he stepped down as proconsul, he was going to be prosecuted by his enemies for his illegal Gallic wars, this does seem to have some sense. However, undoubtedly, this in hindsight added to his power as Cassius Dio reports. Cassius Dio, Roman History, Book 53, Chapter 18. They have been set free from the laws, as the very words in Latin express it. That is, they are exempt from all binding tradition and are not liable to any of the written laws. Thus, by means of these democratic titles, they have vested in themselves all of the authority of the government to such an extent that they actually possess everything that kings possessed except their paltry title. Unsurprisingly, Augustus was starting to run into increasing resistance to his blatant autocracy. The first such instance of political crisis in 24 BC was the trial of Marcus Primus. It must be understood that it was illegal to begin a war against someone without the Senate's permission. Myostas, treason, was the crime for breaking this rule. Marcus Primus, governor of Macedonia, was accused of making an illegal war on the Odrysiae, a Thracian tribe. First, he threw himself into the proverbial frying pan by saying that he had gotten approval for the war from Augustus, and then threw himself into the fire by saying that Marcellus, Augustus's nephew, had approved the war as well. Primus was brought to trial, and Augustus, without being summoned to the court, but attending anyway, denied that he had instructed Primus to wage the war. Primus's advocate, Licinius Varro Murrina, rebuked Augustus and said, What are you doing here, and who summoned you? To which Augustus replied, The res publica. A number of the jury voted to acquit Primus, but he was convicted and found guilty. His supporters liked his quick wits against Murrina, and Augustus was given the right to summon the Senate when he wished after this. His detractors thought him a perverter of the laws. Let us analyse the situation and reveal why Augustus was in a bad light because of this affair. Firstly, it is possible that Primus did get permission from Augustus, or Marcellus, or both, for his war against the Thracians. This was illegal because Primus was proconsul of Macedonia, which was a public province, and therefore outside of the jurisdiction of Augustus. He had no business giving governors outside of his province orders. That was illegal and could see Augustus put to trial. If nothing else, it would give Augustus great odium for such an unlawful act. Thus, Augustus dropped Primus like a ton of bricks and did his best to get Primus convicted. This further put Augustus in a bad light because it was illegal to give evidence without being invited to the trial, just as today a person cannot walk into a trial and give evidence. Hence why Murano rebuked him. Augustus was interrupting a trial and using his influence to affect its outcome. His reply the res publica, makes it sound as if he was the state, which is pretty monarchic. The jury clearly showed their dissatisfaction by defying the clear indication of Augustus, and a few voted to acquit Primus. Had they succeeded in getting him found not guilty, it would mean that Primus had got permission from Augustus for his war, meaning Augustus was in the wrong. Fortunately for Augustus, Primus was convicted, 
but Augustus had broken the law to do so. The trial, according to Cassius Dio, is said to have inspired the succeeding Caipio conspiracy. Fannius Caipio led a conspiracy to murder Augustus later in 24 BC. Lucius Varro Marina, the brother of Licinius Varro Marina, was a chief conspirator. However, apart from this conspiracy, he is said to have been a good, law-abiding Roman senator. These conspirators seem to have mostly come from the senatorial classes and the equites, as Caipio and Marina were from distinguished families. Marina's sister was even married to Mycenaeus, Augustus's right-hand man. Augustus fell out of Mycenaeus because he told his wife Terentia, Marina's sister, that her brother's conspiracy had been discovered. After this plot was discovered by Castricius, one of Augustus's friends, the conspirators soon came to trial. His prosecutor was his own son-in-law, Tiberius, who was quaestor for that year. However, the conspirators did not turn up. Augustus conducted the trial anyway. Even so, some jurors voted to acquit the conspirators. This was most likely a protest at Augustus rather than for the conspirators, since it was illegal to convict someone that was absent from their trial. Shortly after the trial, the conspirators were found and killed. Augustus followed this up by making a law that made judicial votes for absent defendants public rather than secret, but they had to be a unanimous vote for a guilty conviction. Perhaps to show some impartiality, Augustus allowed Caipio's father to punish the slave that had not helped his son and rewarded the one that did. However, Augustus gained odium for allowing sacrifices to be voted and offered for his victory over the conspiracy. He was celebrating the death of Roman citizens. If nothing else, the Caipio conspiracy shows that the senatorial aristocracy was at breaking point and Augustus's blatant control of the state could not continue. Then, soon after the Caipio conspiracy, Augustus fell ill and nearly died. Problems were brewing. As the years since the first constitutional settlement passed, it became obvious that the first constitutional settlement had not restored the Republic and had merely clothed Augustus's power in republican institutions. His consistent illegal acts kept mounting up. He was consul consecutively every year since 31 BC, which was illegal. His co-consuls were repeating as well like Agrippa and Statilius Taurus, his friends. He had made private grievances matters of state. He had broken judicial laws, interfered with the public provinces, started promoting his relatives into the Cursus Sonorum as clear heirs to his estates. He had monopolised military honours and glory, prevented Crassus from dedicating the Spolia Opima. Triumphs had come to an end. Cornelius Gallus had committed suicide. He had built monarchic buildings like his palace on the Palatine Hill and his family mausoleum. The Senate was seeking his approval for foreign matters which it had never done before and created positions which even to his friends had too much power associated with them and was contrary to republican tradition. The Primus trial and the subsequent Caipio conspiracy where Caipio actually planned to kill Augustus to restore the republic just as was hoped with Caesar were indicators of the rising resentment against Augustus's power from the aristocracy. Since juries were made up of one-third senators and two-thirds equites, the fact that twice they try to fly in the face of Augustus exposes the anger of the elite against him. Something had to change, for were it to continue, further trouble was likely to follow. Things finally came to a head when Augustus fell ill from a local epidemic and nearly died in 23 BC. Rome had been flooded. His nephew and heir to his estates, Marcellus, died soon after his games as Aedile, 
Uncertainty would have been the watchword for those times. Suetonius describes the event. Suetonius, Life of the Divine Augustus, Chapter Twenty Eight. He twice considered restoring the Republic. First, immediately after crushing Antonius, in view of Antonius's not infrequent accusations that it was he who was the obstacle to its restoration, and again when. Exhausted by a chronic illness, he summoned the magistrates and senate to his house and gave them a summary of the state of the empire. But on reflecting that private life would be not without risks and that it would be rash to entrust the state to the control of a group of people, he continued to hold on to it, arguably with better results than intentions. Cassius Dio has a fuller account of the events. Cassius Dio, Roman history. Book fifty three, chapter thirty to thirty two, Augustus became consul for the eleventh time with Calpurnius Piso, as with his colleague, and was then again taken ill. This time so seriously that there appeared to be no hope of his recovery. At any rate, he arranged all his affairs as if he were at the point of death, and gathered around him the officers of state and the most prominent senators and knights. He did not indicate any successor, although everybody was expecting that Marcellus would be the first choice for this position. However, he spoke to the company for a while about matters of public policy, delivered to Piso the list of the forces and the records of the public revenues written in a book, and handed his ring to Agrippa. He became too weak to deal with even the most urgent matters, but a certain Antonius Musa. Restored him to health by means of cold baths and cold potions. In return for this service, Musa was paid large sums by both Augustus and by the Senate, and was also given the right to wear gold rings, for he was a freedman. He was also granted exemption from taxes, both for himself and for the other members of his profession, not only his contemporaries but even future generations. However, fate decreed that the man who had taken into his own hands the function both of fortune and of destiny should himself become ensnared. For while Augustus's life was saved in this way, Marcellus, when he fell ill, not long afterwards received the same treatment from Musa, but died. Augustus delivered a eulogy in the traditional manner, gave him a public burial, and placed his body in the tomb which he was building. He also completed as a memorial to the young man the theatre whose foundations had already been laid by Julius Caesar, and which was now named the Theatre of Marcellus in his honour. He also gave orders that a golden image, a golden crown, and a curule chair should be carried into the theatre at the festival of the Roman Games, and should be placed in the midst of the magistrates who officiate at these. These actions were carried out later. At the time when Augustus had recovered his health, he brought his will into the Senate with the intention of reading it aloud, so as to inform the world that he had left no successor to the empire. However, this reading never took place, for no one would consent to it. But what caused universal astonishment was his attitude towards Marcellus. He had shown his love for Marcellus both as a son-in-law and as a nephew. And besides, conferring other honors upon him had gone out of his way to help the young man make a brilliant success of the games which he was supervising as aedile. Thus, throughout the whole summer, the forum had been sheltered by means of a canopy stretched overhead. A dancer who was a knight and a woman of noble birth had been persuaded to take part in the stage performances, and yet Augustus had not entrusted the monarchy to him, and had given his preference to Agrippa. From this, it would appear that he did not yet possess confidence in the young man's judgment, and that he either wished the people to recover their liberty or Agrippa to be given the leadership by them. Certainly, he understood that Agrippa was much beloved by the people, and he wished to avoid the impression that the supreme power was being entrusted to him by Augustus's decision alone. So, when he regained his health and discovered that Marcellus. Not well disposed towards Agrippa, because of what had happened, he immediately sent the latter to Syria, so that no occasion for friction or quarrelling might arise through their being in one another's company. Agrippa immediately left Rome, but did not travel as far as Syria. 
Instead, he acted with even more than his accustomed tact, sent his subordinates there and himself waited in Lesbos. These were the actions taken by Augustus in the manner I have described. The number of praetors appointed was ten, since he considered that no more than these were required, and this figure was maintained for several years. His intention was that most of them should perform the duties as before, but that two should be in charge of financial administration each year. After he had given detailed instructions on these matters, he went to the Alban Mount and formally laid down the consulship. Even since the conduct of affairs of state had been regularised, both he himself and most of his colleagues had held the office for a full year. He now wished to suspend this practice, so that as many men as possible might serve as consuls, and he arranged for his resignation to take place outside the city, so that he should not be hindered in his purpose. He was praised both for his action in itself, and because he chose Lucius Cestius to replace him. This man had always been an ardent supporter of Brutus, had fought with him in all his campaigns, and even at this time cherished his memory, possessed statues of him and delivered eulogies on him. It seems that Augustus, far from disapproving of Cestius's loyalty and attachment to his friend, honoured him for that reason. Because of this, the Senate passed a resolution that Augustus should be a tribune for life, and gave him the privilege of introducing before the Senate at each session any subject at whatever time he chose, even if he were not then consul. They also voted that he should hold once and for all, and for life, the office of proconsul, so that he should not be obliged either to lay it down on entering the city limits, or to have it renewed when he left them. And for the subject territories, they granted him authority superior to that of governor in each locality. In consequence, both he and the succeeding emperors acquired a certain legal right to employ the tribunician power in addition to their other powers, for neither Augustus nor any other emperor used the title of tribune. Augustus's calling of a concilium, a kind of council, a practice in both family and official life, was a very republican thing to do. He thought he was dying, and so gave his consul Piso an appraisal of the state situation. The election of Piso himself was a sign of Augustus's loosening of his grip on the consulship, since the Calperni Pisoni had neither been supporters of Augustus or Caesar, and now one of them was consul. His handing over of his signet ring to Agrippa meant that he was his heir to his estates and could have acted in his name, but he himself had no personal power. Agrippa was his closest friend and older and more experienced than Marcellus. At this juncture, it is important to think about what could have happened had Augustus died. Was Augustus emperor, as would be recognisable in the future Principate? No. There was nothing stopping his co-consul Piso restoring the Republic had Augustus died. Agrippa could have helped Piso do so, or fled, raised his armies and marched on Rome to establish his power. Considering Agrippa had none of the powers Augustus had, he would have had to build up his power from scratch. There was no principate yet. Augustus's powers are all personal to him, and no other at this point. There were no institutions of the Principate set up that would last beyond Augustus's demise. In the long term, Marcellus was to be the designated successor of Augustus. He was his nephew and was married to Julia, Augustus's daughter. The fact that Augustus tried to show the Senate his will was likely a move to reassure the Senate that Augustus was not trying to establish a dynasty by making Marcellus or Agrippa his heir although it probably said nothing indicative anyway, otherwise Augustus would never have flashed it in front of the Senate's faces. The death of Marcellus also likely laid to rest the Senate's fears that he was going to be Augustus's successor. It seems very unlikely that Agrippa and Augustus fell out over Marcellus, because 1. Augustus most likely would not have given Agrippa his ring, designating him his heir, and 2. 
he wouldn't have sent one of his enemies off to take command of the east, where a large concentration of Roman troops were positioned. Augustus probably sent Agrippa because he needed his best friend to make sure the east was secure, with the Parthians ready to pounce at any moment. His stationing himself at Lesbos would also mean that he could easily return to Italy should something happen to Augustus. In summary, here are the provisions of the Second Constitutional Settlement. Augustus, in his 11th consulship, resigned, and was replaced by a Suffolk consul, Lucius Cestius. Cestius was a supporter of Brutus, who had assassinated Caesar. This may have been a concession to the members of the elite that had fought for the non caesarian armies during the civil wars. Augustus only took up the consulship again twice more, but that was more to introduce his grandsons into public life rather than the way he had been consul from 31 to 23 BC. Augustus declined the office of perpetual censor and instead appointed Aemilius Lepidus and Muntius Plancus as censors to carry out a lustrum. That is a religious ceremony that purified the city of Rome. These two men had been from prescribed families, so this was likely another concession to the senatorial class. They did no other acts other than the lustrum, but they would prove to be the last private censors. One of the powers of the censors was to introduce moral reforms, but they did not. This was something Augustus would do after 18 BC. He refused to be tribune of the plebs for life, but he accepted the power of a tribune, or tribunician potestas. This meant that ten tribunes would be elected without Augustus needing to fill a post. Thus, he did not have to worry about elections or breaking the rules of the Lex Annalis, but still had the power of that position. This was a new innovation. He could introduce whatever matter he wished in the Senate without being consul. This was likely to compensate him for holding the power of a junior magistracy, of tribune, allowing him to remain in the same speaking order in the Senate. Very importantly, he gained Maius Imperium Proconsulare, or Greater Proconsular Power. This meant that he had the power of proconsul without restriction. He could cross the Promerium, the city limits of Rome, without having to lay down his Imperium, nor did he need to renew it when leaving the Pomerium, and was granted authority superior to that of all other governors, meaning he could now legally interact with provincial governors outside of his own province. He also divided Spain into more provinces, now that he had conquered Calabria, and gave one to be a public province in 24 BC. Also, in 23 BC, he handed back Cyprus and Gallia Narbonensis to the Senate as public provinces, because they no longer needed his military protection. This may tie into the fact that his province was an emergency crisis command, and, as they passed back into a sense of normalcy, he handed them back to the Senate. In some ways, Augustus had gained power, especially in the provinces, and personal power separate from the Republic. However, many historians such as Jones, Scullard, Syme and Richardson have stated that once he got the tribunician potestas, that Augustus gained more power than he had done in the first constitutional settlement, and that his autocracy was assured, and that was that. The issue is, why would Augustus need more power, when, from the first constitutional settlement, he clearly had too much power? In addition, how had he gained more power, when most of the provisions for the second settlement were just making official powers that he had or exercised anyway as consul. This settlement was intended to redress the issue of Augustus's power, and, based on the events after 23 BC, it seems like it succeeded. His resignation as consul was a huge blow. A tribune never had as much power as a consul, and he had given up his domination of the consulship. In 23 BC, two people were consul that were not Augustus or one of his friends. He had no power over them either, since they were enemies of his family. And on the other side of the coin, 
they had as much power as him since they were consul. Augustus himself almost never made use of his power as tribune. He never vetoed anything, which was a primary power of the tribune. He only used his power of tribune in 18 BC to pass his moral and social laws. He never used it beforehand or after. His imperium over his province was halfway over anyway, and unless he could get it extended, his power in the provinces would be at an end. Thus, I think it is fair to say that Augustus had actually lost power from the settlement. And we shall see in the next episode what the consequences of this were. With Augustus's climb down from power, despite gaining the foundations for his power as being personal to him, rather than an office of the Republic, he desperately needed to regain his absolute power within the state and prevent it from dissipating. The idea, perhaps, was to let the Senate run things for a bit, and then, after a short break, come back as a kind of saviour, having shown the Senate to be utterly incapable of running things themselves. In 22 BC, there was disaster in Rome. The city flooded, there were severe thunderstorms, there was plague in all Italy, likely continuing from 23 BC, and famine in Rome. The people blamed all of these disasters on the fact that Augustus was no longer consul. That role was being filled by Marcus Marcellus and Lucius Arantius. The people quickly took action. They marched on the Senate, locked them in the Senate House, and threatened to burn it down with the Senate inside if they did not grant Augustus the dictatorship. The Senate agreed. The people took the 24 fasces to Augustus and implored him to become dictator and commissioner for the grain supply. As for the dictatorship, he utterly and dramatically refused, tearing off his clothes on the rustra in the forum and baring his breast, inviting people to kill him rather than accept the dictatorship. As for the cura anona, Augustus set up a permanent office of two ex-praetors, which he appointed for the supervision of the distribution of grain. Augustus enshrined this event in his Res Gestae, Augustus Res Gestae, Part 5, 1-3. The dictatorship offered to me, both in my absence and when I was present by both the people and the senate, I did not accept. During the great shortage of wheat, I did not refuse charge of the grain supply, which I so administered that within a few days I freed the whole city from apprehension and immediate danger at my own costs and by my own efforts. The annual and perpetual consulship offered to me at that same time I did not accept. Although he does not explain why he was offered these offices, it does confirm the events recorded by Cassius Dio and Suetonius. This populist act was hardly meant to quell the crisis, but actually endear himself to the people and make the Senate look totally foolish. This may have been designed to show to the Senate that Augustus could just seize power through the people and dispense with the Senate. There is evidence that Augustus may have engineered the grain shortage, which helped cause this whole affair. Considering that the whole food shortage was resolved in a few days, the food cannot have been too far from Rome, possibly hiding in Ostia. He also relieved them from apprehension. This means that they were not out of food yet, but the supply was running low, implying that this was a supply problem, rather than an actual issue. The fact that Tiberius, Augustus's son-in-law, was quaestor and put in charge of the grain supply in 23 to 22 BC means that if there was a shortage, it was Tiberius's fault. Interestingly, had this issue arisen in the Republic, it would have been the tribunes of the plebs that championed the people's issues. But in 22 BC, where were the ten tribunes? They did nothing, and in fact had done nothing for well over a decade, Augustus, with his newfound power of the Tribune, was in a sense fulfilling their role. 
whether this was a real crisis due to the Senate's failure or fake crisis of Augustus's making, it strengthened Augustus's hand considerably. After Augustus dealt with the crisis in Rome, he then left to go to the provinces, first to Sicily, close to Rome, and then the east, and did not come back until 19 BC. However, while in Sicily, more problems occurred in Rome. In July of 22 BC, there was a significant disturbance in Rome regarding the consular election, breaking out into riots. Marcus Lollius was elected consul, and the other consulship was reserved for Augustus. Augustus refused the office and told them to elect the second consul again. Quintus Lepidus and Lucius Silvanus contested the other consulship, and their rivalry descended into total turmoil. Augustus was asked to intercede and come to Rome. Augustus refused. The two candidates personally went to visit Augustus, but he just let the election occur while the candidates were away. Eventually, Lepidus was elected consul. In 21 BC, Augustus, on Mycenaeus' advice, then sent Agrippa to supervise Rome, and while he was there, married Julia, thus making Agrippa Augustus' son-in-law. Even so, riots continued and prevented the election of the prefect of the city for the Ferrare festival. Augustus then headed off to the east. In 20 BC, Agrippa went to Gaul and then Spain, which meant that there was no strong allies of Augustus in Rome. Three people from the period that Augustus left Rome in 22 BC to his return in 19 BC show up how Augustus's stranglehold over Rome had loosened after the second settlement, despite its reinforcement in the crisis in 22 BC. Ignatius Rufus, Sentius Saturninus, and Cornelius Balbus represent the most determined opposition Augustus had from the Republic before his final solidification of his power over the Roman Empire in 19 BC with the Third Constitutional Settlement. Ignatius Rufus's role in these times is not the clearest, but that is perhaps a result of the sources. Ignatius Rufus appears to have presented the most significant political threat to Augustus after the Second Settlement. Cassius Dio says of him, Cassius Dio, Roman History, Book 53, Chapter 24, Part 4-6. In fact, many men emulate the deeds, even the bad ones of others, rather than guarding against their own downfall. For this was then the case with Marcus Ignatius Rufus, who was edile, among many other fine achievements, had brought assistance to the houses that caught fire in that year, with his own slaves, and a number of other hired ones. For that reason, he had received from public funds the sums he had spent in office, and had been elected praetor illegally. He was so elated by this, and despised Augustus, that he even issued an edict saying that he had handed over the city undamaged and in perfect condition to his successor. All the other leading men were furious about this, particularly Augustus himself, and before long he was to teach Rufus a lesson, not to rate himself above the majority. Meanwhile, he made the Edals responsible for preventing fires and for putting out any blaze or similar which occurred. Valeus Paterculus gives additional details. Phileus Paterculus, Roman History, Book 2, Chapter 91-92. to Shortly afterwards, the Caipio Conspiracy, a similar attempt was made by Rufus Ignatius, a man in all respects resembled a gladiator rather than a senator, securing the favour of the people in his edileship by putting out fires with his own gang of slaves, he increased it daily to such an extent that the people gave him the praetorship immediately after the edileship. It was not long before he dared to become a candidate for the consulship, but he was overwhelmed by the general knowledge of his shameless deeds and crimes, and the state of his property came to be as desperate as his mind. Therefore, 
collecting about him men of his own kind, he resolved to assassinate Caesar in order that he might die after getting rid of him, whose existence was not compatible with his own. Such men are so constituted that each would prefer to fall in a general cataclysm than to perish alone, and though suffering the same fate in the end, to be less conspicuous in dying. He, however, was not more successful than the rest in concealing his designs, and, after being thrust into prison with his fellow conspirators, died the death his life richly deserved. The remarkable conduct of an excellent man, Gaius Sentius Saturninus, who was consul about this time, must not be cheated of its due record. Caesar was absent from the city, engaged in regulating the affairs of Asia and of the Orient, and in bringing to the countries of the world, by his personal presence, the blessings of Augustan peace. On this occasion, Sentius, chancing thus to be sole consul with Caesar absent, adopting the rigorous regime of the older consuls, pursued a general policy of old-fashioned severity and great firmness, bringing to light the fraudulent tricks of the tax collectors, punishing their avarice, and getting the public monies into the treasury. But it was particularly in holding the elections that he played the consul, for in the case of candidates for the questorship, whom he thought unworthy, he forbade them to offer their names, and when they insisted upon doing so, he threatened them with the exercise of his consular authority if they came down to the forum. Ignatius, who was now at the height of popular favour, and was expecting to have his consulship follow his praetorship, as his praetorship had followed his aedileship, he forbade to become a candidate, and failing in this, he swore that, even if Ignatius were elected consul by the votes of the people, he would refuse to report his election. This conduct I consider as comparable with any of the celebrated acts of the consuls of the olden days. Ignatius Rufus had stood in 22 BC for the aedileship of 21 to 20, then immediately stood and served as praetor for 21 to 20 BC. He then stood for election as consul in 19 BC, but the election was refused by the consul Sentius Saturninus. Whether Ignatius Rufus was elected or not is unknown. Ignatius foolishly decided to murder Augustus, was caught and executed in 19 BC. It was because of his popular support, through his effective fire brigade, that he was able to successfully bend the rules and get elected praetor immediately after his aedileship. Ignatius was then again able to rely on his support and went for the consulship. Ironically, despite the grilling Ignatius was given by Phileus Paterculus, he was not doing anything especially unrepublican. He was going very swiftly through the Cursus Sonorum, but so had others, especially the relatives of Augustus, such as Marcellus and Tiberius. Ignatius' reliance on popular support meant that he was not very popular with more conservative politicians, such as Sentius Saturninus, but these were not unknown. Gaius Marius, Clodius, and Julius Caesar had been populist politicians and had done very well in the Republic. Ignatius's fire brigade made him very popular and a political threat to Augustus, showing that it was still possible to rival him. Also, let us remember his statement that Ignatius had handed over the city to his successor undamaged. Considering that Ignatius had offered tangible help to the people of Rome, whereas Augustus had only saved the people from the apprehension of a suspicious grain shortage, and then had done nothing during the riots of the consular elections for that year, he had done what Augustus had failed to do. Coming back to Sentius Saturninus, the good old Republican consul, he was elected sole consul for 19 BC. The electorate had voted the other consulship to Augustus, but he had refused the position. Sentius 
tried to hold more elections, but the people rioted. The Senate asked Augustus's advice, and he appointed Quintus Lucretius, one of the Senate's envoys as the other consul. However, the res gestae is most revealing of what happened next. Augustus, res gestae, 11 to 12, paragraph 1. The Senate consecrated the altar of Fortuna Redux before the temples of honour and virtue at the Porta Capena in honour of my return, and it ordered that the pontifices and vestal virgins should make an annual sacrifice there on the anniversary of my return to the city from Syria in the consulship of Quintus Lucretius and Marcus Vinicius. 19 BC, and it named the day the Augustalia from my cognomen. What happened to Sentius Saturninus, consul of 19 BC? Presumably, he had been kicked out of the consulship by the time Augustus returned to Rome. But why? It's because he was acting too much like a traditional republican consul, independent of Augustus. Sentius Saturninus had succeeded in refusing the election of a consul, Ignatius Rufus. He had exposed the corruption of the publicani, that's the tax farmers, and punished them, improved the collection of revenue for the fisc, refused the nomination of certain men to the questorship, and threatened them if they tried to be elected anyway. Sentius's independence showed the state did not require Augustus to function. Not once did he defer to Augustus, and in fact alone, he was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against a populist politician and win out over him. If Sentius Saturninus could deny consuls, as well as quaestors, to be elected to those positions, he might very well deny Augustus that same privilege. Considering that Augustus had committed no end of illegal electoral acts to enter into his former offices, this, with enough courage, might very well have been the case. Sentius Saturninus was just as much a political threat to Augustus as Ignatius Rufus was, except he hailed from the stock of the traditional republicans such as Cicero and Lentulus Spintha, rather than the populists like Cinna and Gaius Marius. Another interesting factor that shows that Augustus's hold on power in Rome was loosening in 22 to 19 BC was the return of triumphs. In 21 BC, Sempronius and Lucius Aratinus, proconsuls of Africa, held a triumph. Then, in 19 BC, Cornelius Balbus, proconsul of Africa, held a triumph for his sub Saharan expedition. He even erected a theatre in Rome, as was the Triumphator's right. The brief return of military glory in the absence of Augustus would not have happened had Augustus had a firm control of the Senate and Rome. However, after 19 BC, Balbus was the last Triumphator, as his was the last name on the Fasti Triumphales. With the return of Augustus in 19 BC to Rome, a third and final constitutional settlement occurred that finally cemented the power of Augustus. The return of Augustus to Rome was made a festival called the Augustalia. He refused more honours, but gave Tiberius the rank of ex-praetor, and let Drusus stand for office five years before he was legally able. Drusus was the brother of Tiberius. Augustus refused a triumph and had an Orvatio instead for his Parthian victory. He erected the Fasti Capitolini, a triumphal arch which details a list of all of the triumphators. The last name inscribed on the Fasti Capitolini was Balbus, and it was purposefully designed so that there was no more room for any new names. Effectively, Augustus had ended triumphs again. Balbus was also the last private individual to build a public work in Rome. From now on, people who weren't the emperor were given triumphal honours instead of actually being triumphator, and they could build and upkeep roads and infrastructure instead. 
Augustus was offered by the Senate to be supervisor of laws and morals with absolute power. Curator legum et morum sumner potestat solus. However, Augustus, so that he may not take any magistracy that was contrary to ancestral practice, refused this, and instead was granted the cura morum, or overseer of the public morals, and censorial power for five years. This was again offered in 18 BC and 11 BC. However, he never passed any moral or social legislation as censor. He did this using his tribunician power. The main thing is that from 19 BC onwards, the Senate gave Augustus the consent to pass laws that censors normally would through his tribunician power. It becomes vague, perhaps deliberately, which of Augustus's power he used so that he could act whenever he needed. This confusion can be seen in Suetonius's Life of Augustus, chapter 27, 5, where he says, He also received a control of morals and laws in perpetuity, which is wrong, he refused this, by virtue of which, although he lacked the office of censor, which is true, but he used his tribunician power, not his censorial power, he carried out free censuses of the people, which is correct. As part of the third constitutional settlement, Augustus was voted consular power in perpetuity with 12 lictors, and he was permitted a seat between the two elected consuls in the Senate. They also offered that laws that Augustus proposed should be called Augustan laws, leges Augusti. Although Augustus refused the Senate's proposal to get the people to swear to keep them, known as sanctio, a sanctio would make the Senate have to obey a law, thus making it difficult to repeal or amend. Now Augustus held virtually all of the powers of the major officers in the Senate, tribune, censor, and most importantly of all, consul. This had the great benefit that he could use the power of these officers without breaking any of the rules of the Republic, like the Lex Annalis. Richardson, in Augustan Rome, 44 BC to AD 14, The Restoration of the Republic and the Establishment of the Empire, page 114, argues and denies that Augustus accepted consular power because it was unprecedented and unconstitutional and is not mentioned in the Res Gestae only in later histories such as Cassius Dio, writing in the 3rd century. In addition, Augustus refused such a power in 22 BC. Instead, he took the honours of being a consul and their rank, but did not accept consular power in perpetuity. However, if we follow the primary sources, like Cassius Dio, we accept that Augustus did take consular power, and that he had more power than ever before something that A.H.M. Jones in his Augustus agrees with. If we take Richardson's argument, Augustus's power had no significant change from the third constitutional settlement that he did not already have from the second. There are arguments against Richardson's idea. Firstly, the granting of consular power in this way was not unprecedented, as Augustus had gained tribunician power in 22 BC. It's a different power, but it's the same precedent, and, since it is the power based on the Republican office, rather than anything extraordinary, it was definitely not unconstitutional. This power was also different from the offer he was made in 22 BC. Then, he was offered the annual and perpetual consulship, not consular power. As to his not mentioning his consulares potestas, the same argument could be made for the tribunician potestas, because he did not mention his being granted that either. But we know he had it, because he says he used it, and it's on his coins. But more to the point, Augustus does mention his consular power in the res gestae. Augustus, res gestae, part 8, 3-4. The second time I performed a lustrum by myself with Consular Imperium in 8 BC. Thirdly, I performed a lustrum with Consular Imperium with my son Tiberius Caesar as colleague in AD 14. Augustus does not mention the granting of the power of a tribune or consul in his res gestae, 
because they are very unrepublican, and the restorer of the Republic is hardly going to advertise on whacking great big stones that he restored the Republic after being granted various perpetual powers, which kind of subverts the former statement. Another point about the third constitutional settlement is that it helped to solidify Augustus's power before his grant of Imperium over a large province expired on the 31st of December 18 BC. Considering the resurgence of the Republicans in 22 to 19 BC, such as Balbus, Sentia Saturninus, and Ignatius Rufus, Augustus needed to capitalize on his heavily propagandized victory over Parthia where he negotiated the return of the Eagle Standards captured at the Battle of Carai in 53 BC. Also, Augustus' Imperium was based on the fact that his was a crisis command to make sure that the provinces and Rome were safe from emergency. By 19 BC, Augustus was simply running out of emergencies, seen in his return of Cyprus, Gallia Narbonensis, and Hispania Baetica to the control of the Senate, as public provinces. In Rome, the plague was over, the flooding and thunderstorms had gone, and he had already resolved the apprehension over his dubious grain supply shortage. The troubled elections he had recently had were hardly a reason to give Augustus emergency powers. If another Sentius Saturninus or Agnatius Rufus turned up, they would pose a serious threat to Augustus's power, as they both had done and one might succeed in breaking Augustus' power. Thus, Augustus's motivation for the settlement in 19 BC must have been to arrange something before the end of 18 BC, where his imperium expired. The third settlement also meant that he regained the powers he had lost after the second settlement, where he stepped down from the consulship. He now also had Maius Imperium Proconsulare, as well as tribunician power. As a result of the third constitutional settlement, his powers were now fuller and more concrete than in 27 BC, after the first constitutional settlement. What about the senators? How did they respond to this considering their opposition in the 20s? In short, we don't know. Some may have been acquiescent. Others may have given up. Perhaps the main consideration for why the senate did nothing to stop Augustus, was the majority of the armies were still held by him. Even if a proconsul of Africa rebelled, he would have to face all of Augustus's forces, which might prove counterproductive, as it would give Augustus a new emergency to exploit. Now I shall compare the differences between the first and the third constitutional settlements. In the first, in 28 to 27 BC, Augustus came back to Rome and divested himself of his tyranny, and publicised this as the restoration of the Republic, pretending to give up power. This established an Augustan foundation myth, whereas in 19 BC, where there is far less publicism about it, Augustus came back to Rome, having given up powers and regained them. In effect, a soft coup where Augustus gained absolute power over the state, and the army. Interestingly, one thing is no longer mentioned in any source for 19 BC. Augustus's commitment to restore the Republic. The Republic was, after 19 BC, not going to be restored. The third constitutional settlement of 19 BC was the final solidification of Augustus's power. Many of his acts and foundations of the Principate followed on from 19 BC in a way that they had not done for either 27 or 23 BC. He reformed the army. He passed his social and moral laws and the organisation operation of the Principate beyond simply the emperor, such as the transformation of the Senate from a competitive oligarchy into an aristocracy of service, begins to appear. 19 BC was the political foundation of the powers of the Princeps, but there was still a long way to go before Augustus's Rome became the Principate that Tiberius would inherit. After 19 BC, there were still further political developments, 
but these were more additions to what Augustus had established rather than the political chess game of the 20s BC. In 18 BC, Augustus was given a five-year extension to his imperium and his tribunician power. Suetonius is incorrect in saying that it was perpetual. It was renewed every five years, or ten years, as shown in the Laudatio Agrippae. He also gave Marcus Agrippa tribunician power for five years. It was in this year that he passed many of his laws, such as his social and moral laws, that helped to set up the character and institutions of the Principate. In 16 BC, Augustus made Titus Statilius Taurus prefect of Rome. This was the same office that Massala Corvinus had held and then resigned from because it held too much power. Taurus remained in the office for the rest of Augustus's reign and is chiefly responsible for law and order in Rome for Augustus. Augustus also held the secular games celebrated every 100 or 110 years. In 13 BC, Augustus's imperium was extended again for five years, and Agrippa's tribunician power was also extended for five years. Agrippa was also given Maius Imperium Proconsulare, which means that he was the highest authority in any province. However, Agrippa was not granted the consular power. That was only held by Augustus. The granting of the tribunician power to first his son-in-law Agrippa and then Tiberius was a dynastic action rather than making them a proper colleague. To compare this to 23 BC, all Augustus could do to show that Agrippa was his heir was give him his signet ring. In 12 BC, Augustus was elected corrector of the public morals for five years. In this year also, Agrippa died, depriving Augustus of his best friend and heir. Augustus was elected Pontifex Maximus after the death of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, the triumvir from 20 years earlier, and holder of the office for the whole of that time. He died in the previous year. Augustus was now elected Chief Priest of Rome. This was a title that Roman emperors held from Augustus to Gratian. In 8 BC, Augustus' imperium was renewed for another 10 years, apparently with a show of reluctance. In 5 BC, Augustus was elected consul for a few months with the main aim of introducing Gaius Caesar, his grandson, into the Senate. In 2 BC, Augustus was again elected consul for the 13th and last time to introduce his grandson Lucius Caesar into the Senate. Also in 2 BC, the Senate voted to give Augustus the title of Father of the Fatherland, or Pater Patriae. Although Daddy Augustus might sound nice and friendly to us, Roman fathers owned their family. They owned their wife, their sons, their daughters, their slaves, and their entire household. They wielded absolute authority over them. The power of the pater familias only ended when the father died. Augustus was now the pater familias of the whole Roman Republic and now they were in his manos, or hands. An inscription from Tacinum from 2 BC tells us the titulature of Augustus. Ehrenberg and Jones, Documents Illustrating the Reigns of Augustus and Tiberius, Item 61. Imperatori Caesari Divi Filio Augusto, Pontifici Maximo, Patri Patriae Auguri, Quindecim viri sacris facindis septum viri epulonum tredecim consuli septesim imperator tringita tribunicia potestat or to commander Caesar son of a divine one Augustus chief priest father of the fatherland augur one of the board of fifteen for public rights a priesthood one of the board of seven for Epulons, another priesthood, consul thirteen times, saluted as general seventeen times, tribunician power for the thirtieth time. Not very republican. Indeed, it flies in the face of his statement that he never held more power than any other magistrate 
or contrary to the Republic. In AD 3, Augustus renewed his imperium for another ten years. In AD 6, Tiberius was granted the tribunician power, and possibly the Maius Imperium Proconsulare as well. In AD 13, Augustus renewed his imperium for a further ten years. In AD 14, Augustus wrote the Res Gestae Divi Augusti. Its texts were designed to be written in two great bronze slabs which would flank the entrance of the Tomb of the Julii, or Mausoleum of Augustus. On the 19th of August, AD 14, Augustus died. Jones and Miller believe that after 27 BC, because Augustus had all of the armies legitimately, the rest was an irrelevant facade. To the people in the provinces, he was a king, as they would recognise one. However, if the settlements were all meaningless, and Augustus was just a military dictator, why did Augustus not get rid of the Senate when it started to kick up a fuss? He never played the populist or militarist card. He could have let the people burn down the Senate in 22 BC, or marched an army on Rome, like Sulla had done whenever he received opposition from the Senate. Augustus never prescribed anyone after the civil wars, which had always been a horrifying affair, but yet he could have easily done so. This is something that Valeus Paterculus praised him for. The answers to these questions have to be found in Augustus himself, who must have been a traditionalist because he was reluctant to change the constitution of the Republic. Rather, his actions were to mould the Republic to be able to fit himself into it. This helps to explain why he kept the Senate as well as a measure of gaining the support of the upper classes, and never thought of taking extraordinary offices like dictator in perpetuity or triumvir. Augustus may have seen the key to the Republic was the Senate rather than the people of Rome. By AD 14, the Senate still had meetings. It governed provinces, it led armies, it meted out justice, it held offices, and, for the most part, continued to do all of the functions it had done in the Republic though not with as much power. For the people of Rome, very little changed. In fact, they may well have lost power, since after 27 BC, the tribunitions of the plebs are virtually never heard from again, certainly not in taking political actions, as they had done in the last years of the Roman Republic. This helps to explain why in 29 BC, Augustus changed his rather rash behaviour as a quite obvious autocrat, and went down the path that eventually resulted in his becoming princeps and creating the Principate. Yet, even after 19 BC, it is difficult to say exactly when the Principate was established, until AD 14 when Augustus died, and Tiberius took over as Imperator. And even then, it was impossible to say that Augustus was wholly sure that his legacy would survive, since he knew that Tiberius held Republican sympathies. Both Tacitus and Valeus Paterculus show that Tiberius tried to restore the Republic after Augustus' death. The same could be said for Agrippa, who, in Cassius Dio's invented debate between monarchy and republicanism, he put Agrippa in the role of arguing for the Republic. This might be one of the reasons why Augustus in his Rares Gestae, which he wrote when he was very old, stated that he restored the Republic, so that he could win either way. If Tiberius restored the Republic, then Augustus would be in the clear, and if he didn't, Augustus would be remembered as having tried to do so. In my opinion, Augustus had succeeded in restoring the Republic, and at the same time, also succeeded in creating the Principate. To finish, I shall end with a few words from Suetonius and Tacitus. Tacitus, Annals, Book 1, Chapter 9. The only cure for Rome's civil strife had been ruled by one man, but he had stabilised the state, not by monarchy, nor dictatorship, but with the title of Princeps. Suetonius, Life of Augustus, Chapter 28. 
On reconsideration, however, Augustus decided that to divide the responsibilities of government among several hands would be to jeopardise not only his own life, but also the national security. So he did nothing. The results were almost as good as his intentions, which he expressed from time to time and even published in an edict. May I be privileged to build firm and lasting foundations for the Commonwealth. May I also achieve the reward to which I aspire, that of being known as the author of the best possible constitution, and of carrying with me, when I die, the hope that these foundations will abide with, secure. And indeed, he achieved this success, having taken great trouble to prevent his political system from causing any individual distress. This is the conclusion of the Road to Empire series of videos about the creation of the first Roman emperor, and therefore the ancestor of the Eastern Roman emperors. And this has been Eastern Roman History.